on behalf of the family, I welcome each and every one of you as we gather here in the beautiful gardens of Partridge House to celebrate and remember the life of Helen. Your presence here is very important for it's, for it's the memory of the friends who stood by the family in this difficult time that will be the source of strength and consolation to them later on during those moments of grief and emptiness. My name is Colin Clark of Natural Funerals and in just a moment Pastor Glenda will lead us in today's service. Today is all about love, love for Helen's family. You're all here because you want to pay your respects, you want to say goodbye to her in your own way. There are some that may not have known Helen quite so well. You may be here to support her closest family and friends and this is most welcome too. At a time like this, the more support, the more love, the more time we speak Helen's name, the better. So during today's service, for those that are coming up to speak, there's nothing wrong with showing a bit of support, a bit of appreciation, a little bit of uh, clapping, applause, that would be most welcome to. But at this time, the curse of the mo modern age, the mobile phone, if you could just check and make sure it's on uh, silent, unless you've got a really good ringtone, like Abide With Me, in which case that's okay, you can let it ring. But if you could just check your phones, uh, that would be appreciated. And now I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Glenda to come forward to lead us today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to see everybody here. And, um, you know, I'm just really honoured today to be able to share at Helen's funeral and to be invited to do that. I want to extend my Colin condolences to uh, Dennis and his family, relatives and friends today. You know, Helen has touched many lives, directly and indirectly. So as Colin said, I want to thank you today for your attendance and for your support for the family. You know, we come together with a sense of sorrow and grief as we farewell Helen. However, this is also a great opportunity to celebrate Helen's life. I want to share some thoughts with you today about the fingerprints of Helen. You know, the pattern of your fingerprint is unique to you and it does not change over time. No one else has our fingerprint. Our fingerprint identifies who we are and anything we touch wears the residue of that unique fingerprint. Helen has had her own unique fingerprints and on everyone she touched, she left behind her mark. Today is an opportunity for us to reflect on how Helen has left her mark of identity on each one of us. As I reflect on my experience with Helen, I'm reminded of her unique fingerprints. I want to quickly reflect on five of those fingerprints that left a mark on me and maybe touched your life as well. The first one is her ability to love, to love all people no conditions attached. She would love them and care for them. I recall asking Helen to assist me at times with pastoral care of the women in the church. One lady comes to mind who Helen supported. This lady was in a very low place in her life and homeless. And Helen supported her to a place where she was independent in housing and managing life's responsibilities. To watch Helen love on this lady, care for her, earn her trust, coach her to take care of herself and to be responsible for her own actions and in some instances to exercise Helen's tough love was an amazing thing to watch. Number two, her willingness to serve others. You know, nothing was too hard for Helen to fit into her personal schedule. As part of the church community and I'm sure other community organisations here, you'll vouch for the fact that Helen always made time to connect and serve. Number three was generosity in her time and her talent. This was displayed in Helen's creativity and I'm sure as others speak today, they will talk about Helen's creative abilities. You know, it was the best time I had with Helen because it was a time where we had many laughs. 
with women's morning teas. Helen would, you know, announce the morning tea. She would organize the catering. She would do the decorating. She would call everybody come to come. She would run the event on the day. And I don't know about you, but I love people who can volunteer. You can put their hand up and see a project right through to completion. One of our greatest adventures we had together was setting up a Mexican fiesta. I had the brainwave and Helen had the grunt. Our role was to decorate the foyer of Influences Church at Paradise. Not an easy feat for two people because it's a very large foyer. But we went for it. There are people here today, we raided their gardens for cactuses and anything that looked like a Mexican plant for our displays. We put up bunting, we hung piñatas. And the best of all was when I asked Helen if she could go and buy just a couple of sombreros. So not only did Helen buy two sombreros, she bought 10. She bought 10 ordinary sombreros. Helen then went ahead and painted the sombreros to look very Mexican. How good is that? Stripes of all colours of the rainbow, red and yellow and blue. She really went over the top. Even the Mexicans, I reckon, would have been jealous of what she did with those sombreros. And the most amazing thing is that these are the actual sombreros that she painted. Four years later, they are still being used in our children's department for costumes and for kids to play around in. So that says it all for Helen. Number four was her courage. Mental and moral strength to persevere as fear and difficulties came her way. The courage Helen displayed during her fight with illness was remarkable. Courage enabled her to keep moving forward and keep planning for the future. She was even planning a Christmas in July event very recently. She didn't complain, but she took courage from her relationship with God. Which leads me to my last unique fingerprint of Helen's that touched my life and I pray will touch your life today and encourage you. That fifth one is the fingerprint of faith. Helen's unique faith came about because she understood who created her fingerprint. She knew who she was and her purpose in life. Even from a very early age, Helen had a sensitivity and an awareness of God, an awareness of her creator. In 1980, whilst in the USA, as Dennis was starting to be a chiropractor, Helen and Dennis were struggling to make ends meet. With the little money they had left, they began to sell their possessions to buy groceries. One of the men who came to buy some goods began to tell them about Jesus. And over the next few months, they saw an outpouring of hospitality, love, practical support from Christians that they didn't even know. Around this time, Helen had a personal relation, a personal revelation of who Jesus was and how God sent his son to die and rise again for her personally, rescuing her from a life that lacked hope for eternity to a life of promised eternity. Since that time, Helen discovered her true identity and has never looked back. She grew in her love for God's word and became a strong woman of faith. Those of us that knew her well would see this demonstrated every day in her life, despite the circumstances. I know today that Helen's desire would be that you would discover your creator, the one who designed your unique fingerprints, and for you to have a personal relationship with Jesus like she did. Helen made a difference to my life and to the lives of others. It says in Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. 
So thank you, Helen. Thank you so much for walking in the destiny that God had planned for you and for leaving the mark of your fingerprint on our lives. Let's pray this morning. This afternoon, sorry. We thank you today for giving us the opportunity to know Helen and be a part of her life and impacted by her fingerprints. We know today that as she is in your presence and at peace, free from pain and suffering, I ask today, God, that you comfort those who are gathered here, sustain them, be with them, guide them in the days to come. Surround them with your love that they may not be overwhelmed with their loss, but be confident in your goodness and your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. You know, we're going to move into a time now where Dennis and family and some of the friends are going to share and celebrate Helen's life. Um, I met Helen when she was about 17 and uh, I was 23 and uh, <clears throat> her family had a, uh, a homestead home uh, in an area called Collingham in New South Wales um, which was a, a new irrigation area and uh, the farms were about 500 acres uh, so uh, they had one of those farms but it was land that had been station hunting. So they had a station homestead uh, to live in, and most of the rest of us had sheds to live in. Uh, and so the infrastructure was still being developed, and there were no uh, telephones, no mobile phones. Um, and uh, people used to come to the Arnold's uh, house to use the phone. And uh, so I went there one day, and uh, Helen came to the door and invited me in and turned around and walked into the hallway where the phone was and then walked into the kitchen, which was on the left, uh, and asked me if I'd like a cup of tea. In that time frame where she walked from the door into the kitchen, I went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we met and when we met. Uh, we had a friendship for a, you know, ongoing, and then she went nursing. She wanted to be a nurse, and uh, so <coughs> after a three and a half year course in uh, in Melbourne um, at the Royal Children's Hospital. I think about eighteen months into that is about where we got serious and got engaged. Um, about a year later. Um, her, she, she and a number of her nursing girlfriends decided to do a tour, a bus tour, uh, 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 through uh, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, Northern Territory, and back through Adelaide and then back to Melbourne. Um, along the way, something went, something happened that was not good news to me, and that was that she uh, she met uh, she and a, a, a one of the girls met two guys that were travelling in a mini moke and they hooked up. And uh, when I went to meet her in Melbourne off the bus back from the, the big trip around Australia, she wasn't there. Uh, and her girlfriends were rather embarrassed that I turned up because one of them had called me and said, don't come, but I came. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, So things were pretty lean, not very happy for me during that time. And uh, anyway, she graduated from nursing school and uh, sometime later she, I'm not sure whether she uh, sent me a note, it certainly wasn't a text. <laughs> uh, and said, uh, come and say hello. Uh, so I went to Melbourne and uh, went to the area where she was staying, the place she was staying, uh, and she opened the door and I went, wow! <laughs> she was dressed to the nines. 
And uh, she was basically saying, let's get back together, which we did. And uh, so she was ready to commit. And uh, we got married and we went farming and then finished the farming uh, venture and uh, moved to Griffith where I focused on music. We had a music store and uh, I played in bands and we had a music school. Um, the thing about Helen was that she was absolutely loyal. She stuck with me through all the crazy ideas that I had. Um, moving from the farm to Griffith to start this music thing and then uh, deciding to become a chiropractor and going to America to study chiropractic. Uh, and then coming back to Australia and coming to Adelaide and setting up practice in Adelaide. Uh, the thing that was very difficult for her was that everywhere she went, she made friends, because that was her. She just made friends. She just loved other people. And uh, so every time she left, it was painful. Um, I could see that, but you know, I kept um, moving forward, but it wasn't always the best thing for her. She made friends everywhere she went. Uh, she was a wonderful wife, mother, friend, helpmate. A woman of strength and gentleness at the same time. Her huge characteristic, probably the outstanding one, was that she loved. She loved Jesus. Her Lord, and Jesus was her Lord and Savior and Shepherd and friend. Uh, she loved her family, uh, friends, people. She loved the Lord. She loved everybody. She was just, that was her. Um, her last project where she enjoyed uh, loving people was Thread Together. And uh, so Thread Together is uh, here today, I believe, which is Thread Together is a charity uh, where new players are saved from landfill and uh, given out to those in need. So a scripture that came to mind and has been in my mind since she died is 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So she's with the Lord now and continuing to be a blessing in that heavenly realm. She's free from sickness and pain and suffering. in a new body in the eternal realm. Help. Hi everyone, thanks for coming along today. Um, here today to celebrate the life of Helen. My name is Tim and Helen was my mother. Tim. I know I'm biased, uh, but I think most people here know that Helen was a pretty special woman. She was dearly loved by a lot of different groups of people. Like the rest of her Arnold family, she was ready to laugh with you at the drop of a hat. She was always ready to smile and laugh. Anyone who was lucky enough to meet her basically won the friend lottery. Hmm. Helen was generous and she was gracious. She didn't collect hurts from life. She had an ease and a love that she projected to everyone around her. She was uncomplicated and straight up with people. She didn't like artifice, but she liked art. She wasn't materialistic. She would give you anything she had in a heartbeat if you needed a hand. There'll be various perspectives in the eulogies today from friends and siblings, and thanks for your thoughts, Dad. 
Well, I've only known Helen for 47 years. Uh, some people here have another 20 years on me. So that means I don't know everything about her, but I know a fair bit. I think some unique things I can share with everyone today are what it was like having Helen as a mum, especially in my early years, thinking back to how she influenced who I am today and who all us kids are. When I think of Helen, one of the first things I think is that she had the most unstoppable energy and she loved the project. You're going to hear the project mentioned about a hundred times today. Um, <coughs> this could mean fixing something, changing something, rearranging something, <laughs> painting something, <laughs> taking the paint off something, <laughs> varnishing something, taking the varnish off something, <laughs> doing some craft, doing some portrait painting, doing some landscaping, painting an old door and putting it in the garden as a decoration, chopping back the lawn, another six inches so there was more room for flowers in the garden. Organising an art festival, organising multiple charity groups, helping any number of people in need, helping our kids, making a Christmas in July nativity scene. You get the idea. She was always doing something. Just a year or so ago, she told me a story I hadn't heard before. When she was heavily pregnant with me, I think even on the way to the hospital, Mum had Dad driving her around with the trailer and they were picking up big rocks <laughs> on the side of the road to take home to landscape the front yard. <laughs> Heavily pregnant and running around picking up rocks. That sums up Mum's drive and energy to me in one short sentence. When I was three or four, I remember her leatherwork phase. It was the early 70s, of course ornate punched leather items, bags, belts, containers, key rings, whatever she could think of. She also made little colourful wooden toys just after that when we were living in Griffith. I remember looking at them paint drying on the back veranda as a little kid. I must have joined in with her at some point because she tells me when I was little I was always asking for materials to do stuff and saying more nails, more wood mum. <laughs> She repeated that back to me my whole life when I had my own project on. More nails, more wood mum, she would say to me smiling and remembering me as a little kid. I guess that stuff gets in because I'm a pretty busy doing person myself now. She had an artist's heart and was endlessly creative. By being into so many different things with her project, I think one of the messages she gave us all without saying anything was if you want to go and do something, then have a go, get into it. There's no reason why you can't do that thing you've thought of. Jump in and try and see if it works for you. Don't be afraid of the unknown. And I think that's how she lived day to day. She endlessly encouraged any ideas that us kids had. Uh, and she had a saying that became a cliche in our house. If we came up with something, she would say, write it in your book. <laughs> meaning everyone should have a book that they should write their ideas in so they don't forget them and can do them later. And in her voice, uh, that sounded like, write it in your book. <laughs> and then she would just smile. In 1978, Mum and Dad sold up everything so they'd go and study. So Dad could study at chiropractic college overseas. In South Carolina, in the US, as an adult, I can look back at that and guess how incredibly stressful that must have been to go to a new country with four little kids. Joe was pregnant on the aeroplane uh, on the way. Mum and uh, Mum was pregnant with Joe. Uh, Mum and Dad did not legal, were legally allowed to work, and they were living off the amount of savings that they could take with them. It was tough, no doubt, but Mum, Mum never projected that stress of the situation to us kids. In fact, she made things fun. Eventually, mum and dad had gone through their savings and feeding a family of six hadn't been tough. One of the meals we used to have a lot was a thing called volcanoes, <laughs> which is a fun word that means cheap food for a big family. <laughs> for those of you who aren't across how to make a volcano, I'd just like to quickly explain it. There are three easy steps. It goes, it goes like this. First, make yourself a big pot of mashed potato and place every person's portion of potato 
on that plate in a cone, <laughs> in a cone shape, as tall as you can make it. Then get a tin of tuna, fish, a small amount of tuna on the top of, the, of your potato cone. Visually, this creates a mountain shape that is about to be a volcano. To finish, get some tomato sauce and squirt it on the top of your volcano so it looks like lava running down the sides until you're happy with how much sauce you have. <laughs> oh, and also make sure everyone's laughing while they make their volcano. One other memory I have from that time at that same house in America was the time that my mum and I set the whole backyard on fire together. <laughs> we had a big backyard and a large part of it was entirely covered in tall, dry weeds over summertime, I guess. I wanted to be helpful and get rid of the weeds for mum and dad, and I presented an idea to mum on how we could manage it. I remember saying to mum, how about if we take this big sheet of plywood and we light a fire in just one little spot and when the weeds in that spot are burnt, we put the sheet over that spot, which will put the fire out, and we do that over and over again until we've worked our way around the yard. I was all set for a work day with Mum. Well, for some reason, she said to me, yes, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> the only flaw in my plan... Battery issue. The only flaw in my plan that I didn't know about as a nine-year-old was that if you actually drop a big flat sheet of something onto dry weeds that are on fire, the fire actually gets fanned out in all directions. <laughs> and you generally have a lot more fire than you were anticipating. <laughs> well, the fire brigade was called out. We burnt the whole yard down, as well as three of the neighbors' wooden fences. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Details aside, that's an example of mum being in things with her kids, backing their ideas, giving them room to learn a few things in life. As they say, experience is what you get just after you need it. Her sickness at the end didn't take her spirit away. She was laughing, smiling, trying to put everyone else at ease in the room right to the end, even while she was suffering. Mum, to me, was a life, once in a lifetime beautiful person. She loved everyone in her life and lived life to the full. Dad and all her brothers and sisters call Mum Helly, sometimes Helen Mary. She was incredibly close to so many people. She influenced and loved so many. As far as I can tell, all the group, different groups here that knew her like to think of her as our Helly. She was loved by us all. To me, she is our Helly, and she'll be dearly missed. I've got two words. Cup of tea. <laughs> cup of tea and a bicky. Cup of tea and a piece of toast with some jam. Cup of tea and a cry. A cup of tea was her way to sit down and connect sit down and share empathy. She loved connecting with people and creating a sense of unity. You all knew that about her and it's that love of her that has brought you all here today. Welcome everyone, thank you all, whether you've traveled far or just around the corner. We are glad that you're here and, and maybe watching this online later. Um, celebrating Helen's life and the joy she brought us and grieving together in our loss. I'd like to focus on a few, few things about <coughs> Helen in the last four years since she was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, there were some things that became quite apparent as she went through the toughest battle in her life. You know Helen was a little bit special. She was a quiet achiever and a great cheerleader, cheering on women to be their best and know that they were loved and accepted. She was always wanting to build others up and foster unity. At the time of her diagnosis, she started to get involved with the not-for-profit organisation Thread Together, which gave new clothes to people who needed a lift or a boost in life. She introduced Thread Together to Catherine House, a women's shelter uh, that was helping survivors of domestic violence, women who were escaping all sorts of horror with their kids and had no clothing. One woman wept as mum said, you look pretty in that dress. 
It was the first time in 40 years that she ever, that she had ever had any new clothing after a lifetime of abuse. And that impact, building someone up like that, was substantial and she loved to do it. And she was good at it. And she did it over and over without stopping. She went on to introduce Fred together to 10 major charity services here in South Australia, including Anglicare, who named a van after her, which acts as a mobile wardrobe, which has an even greater reach of delivering clothes to those who can't get themselves to an agency. And Helen's quiet connections have led to now over 10,000 people being helped in South Australia, with more than 30,000 items of clothing being delivered. And she was proud and honored to be a part of that community service, giving dignity to others. She was an up and go kind of person, always with a project on the boil, as you've heard from Tim, um, or several projects. And my partner here, I recently asked me, what did your mum make you when you were sick in bed? After explaining to me that his mum made him soft boiled rice, which is a Japanese remedy for an upset tummy. I couldn't think, and I told mum this story, and she said, I'm ready to get out of bed. There was never any time to lie around, and not even sickness was an excuse to do nothing. This became abundantly clear in the last few years as she lived with her foot to the floor, painting, crafting, sewing, making patchwork blankets she called happy blankets for her grandkids, and extending the idea to homeless people. These blankets are good because they have some patches from old jeans, so they have a pocket with a zip. It was always practical to put things in the pocket with a zip. Um, and as the cancer spread to her brain, she became a little more manic in these last months, the nativity set. Uh, after a recent visit to a hospital, she saw nurses had set up a Christmas nativity set. And mum wanted to recreate this, but her version. Shepherds and sheep with some angels watching them. Uh, and she wanted to involve as many people as possible in this creation. Uh, cousin Estelle said, it's like she's the angel watching over the family, the sheep, the flock of sheep. And Uncle Don said that she used to take care of orphan lambs every season. And the lambs loved her and followed her everywhere. So this nativity set had many layers of meaning for her. And she said to me days before she died, well, that was fun. It brought us all together, gave the family something to do. It was fun. <laughs> and that was her heart, the unity and inclusion. You get it, she said. I certainly do. <laughs> she told me several years ago two things that uh, really struck me, um, and it was some Helen insight and wisdom. She said, friends are hard to find, true friends, and when you find them, hold on to them. They are your treasures. She is, and I do. And the other thing she said was, we all die alone meaning we all go through that gate by ourselves and it is true and no one happened no one knows what happens after death until you're dead but i wanted to hold her hand as she went through that gate her breathing increased to shallow rapid uh to shallow and rapid in the last couple of hours and her eyes were mostly shut but at the very end she sat up and she stared at me wide eyed just like for about 10 seconds uh, as if to communicate something, but without expression of emotion, either good or bad emotion. And it was eerie and it was puzzling. It was also very powerful. And up until that point, I had the chance to tell her that she did well, that we love her and we are proud of her. She left a great legacy and, an incredible, and was an incredible role model. And as she gazed at me in that last moment, I said, you can go now, mom, we love you. You can go to heaven and be with God. Her angels had come. So we've set up her nativity set at the wake. Uh, well done, Helen. You showed us how to create unity, and we've done it. And we will always honor you with that, and you make us so proud. You're a good mama to all us kids. And I, I have a few thank yous, and then I'm done. And thank you to my siblings for helping 
us get to this point giving mum the best send-off ever and dad for your ceaseless effort and care looking after her through that her demise. Carly Fisher for making mum's trip to Italy. Israel. And Buckingham Palace. Seamless, seamlessly easy. Booking that electric wheelchair. Okay. Everywhere, you know, once we learnt she couldn't move her legs much more. That put a massive smile on her face. And she loved running over our toes. <laughs> Especially dads. <laughs> and Amanda Sandaru, you're not here, but I know you're coming afterwards. Your kindness to mum, your empathy, and giving nature was a wonderful support to her and to me, sharing from your own struggle with cancer. You were quite strong. You were a quiet, strong current of strength to our family, and we'll, we will be forever grateful. And Don and Kate, her cherished siblings, and all the siblings, actually. Your care in the end, Kate, showed me what true love looks like. Curled up on the bed, stroking her, and whispering love into her ear. You cherished her. And Peg, this is a sad birthday for you today, saying goodbye to your baby sister. I can thank all of you. You've all shown love and support and care to Helen. Um, and like you said, Mum, I did good. Thank you. Beautiful. Bless you, Helen. We love you. Um, my name is Kate Smeaton. I'm Helen Mary Power's youngest sister and love to be the leader. Helen was mid nine siblings and a loved sister and daughter to Ailsa and Leonard Arnold. Our parents instilled within their family qualities for a fair, charitable, caring outlook. Do unto others. We all started our schooling by correspondence, our parents taking in governesses to assist. In turn, uh, sorry, in turn, mum had to create a social network for both her children and the governesses. This included building and maintaining a tennis court and lots of driving. Um, the police quote on Helly obtaining her licence. Mrs Arnold, your daughter's got a heavy foot. <laughs> she did. We learned to be creative for fun and for survival out in the sticks of New South Wales, Gory Park. Helly inherited mum's and Nana's social zany outlook, very social girls. So Helly had the, all these qualities in spades. All of us had to leave home for school, uni, college, or work, including boarding. That separation so young brought great anguish both to those leaving and to those who were left at home. Not unlike today. But there was nothing more exciting than a sibling coming home. We hung in there for weeks, but he was coming home. Young Helen coming home meant taking over Lou's duties, charged with looking after my safety on this property out in sticks, from snakes and other wildlife, stock and mischief. Yeah. Helly kept me occupied. Haircuts, walks down the paddock, making up stories, art and craft and so on. Helen brought home music, the Beatles. <laughs> we all danced on the lawn. She had us all collecting gum leaves, gum nuts and branches and painting them silver and gold to decorate for Christmas. She loved going down the creek amongst the gum trees with her little brothers, Johnny and Steve, and helping Dad with the sheep. 
our cousin Bobby has brought um, some some of the gum trees from that leaf uh, from that creek today, and we've put them in amongst the petals for uh, for the service. Um, later at Collyambly, Lucy and Helen sunbaking, all of us reading, listening to music, and painting. Helen bringing home new ideas for cooking from Melbourne. She lived with our Andy Alex in Melbourne. Um, in 1970, Bruce, Kelly and Don all married. <clears throat> I'd ride my bike across Collyambly to visit Helen uh, with her baby Tim in their first shed flat. <laughs> Kelly was snowed under learning to be a mum. The power family soon moved to Griffith. They grew, they grew to three gorgeous boys. This was Helly's leather phase, as Tim mentioned earlier, <laughs> making handbags, book covers, containers, and jewellery from leather. This was the start of her pay it forward, for, um, which continued as well. Me being the last one home, she put me up in Christmas 74 and we heard the terrible Cyclone Tracy devastation on the radio. I, I think um, our dad might have been sick at that stage. I think that's why I was staying with me. Um, and again, they put me up in 1976 when I was on a teaching round in Griffith. On return from USA, um, taking Kelly then took on Donnie's kids at times, so continuing the paying it forward. Kelly grew in tolerance and grace, dealing with her own huge transitions of having to leave her family young, leaving the country with her young family, returning with a beautiful daughter, uh, being away from family support as life's trials and tribulations increase. Thank goodness for the phone and later the internet. Also, thank goodness for her stitched together girlfriends from Thread Together and her church and community. <coughs> Helly's wishes were for her powerhouse to unite, not to blame one another for their tribulations, to be tolerant and caring to each other, to be responsible for your actions and to find peace and happiness. To stow the crap in that second drawer until you can deal with it or that it no longer exists. <laughs> for her girlfriends, she wanted um, you to be each other's sisters, to share your hearts, be charitable and have fun in her memory. We thank all of you girls for your love and support for our beautiful sister. Finally, to my siblings and extended family, we are charged with holding her memory and her desires to share them with her children whenever they require that support and understanding. Bless you, Helen. today to be allowed to speak a few words about Helen and what she meant to me as a friend. Um, Helen was dedicated to her family as a wife and a mother, a mother-in-law and a grandmother. She was generous with her time and materially generous and nothing was ever too much trouble for Helen. She was always helping out. Her home was always open to her family and her extended family to come and stay. She had the gift of hospitality. We met over 25 years ago at the Christian Family Centre um, and Helen loved the church and she loved the church community <coughs> and she became involved on many levels. Helen became involved in everything. When Helen and Dennis, uh, Helen and Dennis sought the Lord first 
in all of their decisions, reflecting on God's word um, and applying the scriptures to all areas of their lives. Helen was a strong woman of God who lived a life of service to others and to the community. She also had a great sense of adventure and fun and we had several holidays away at the jazz festival at Paul's Gap. Dennis was playing trad jazz and we were his fan club. <laughs> we rented a house with their, and some of their friends from Victoria came over and uh, we had some great weekends listening to all types of jazz. And it was lucky for us that we have Kev with us who was a master storyteller. And he regaled us with many funny stories over the weekend. So there we were amongst the kangaroos with meals on the veranda of the house, surrounded by wild deer, kookaburras, possums, cockatoos. And the house, the house was a multi-storey wooden structure in dense bushland. And we used to laugh and say, well, it's the height of summer of what can go wrong. <laughs> There was never a bushfire, <laughs> We have many happy get memories of all gaps, as we call it. Helen loved art. She joined the Port Community Arts Centre as a member and soon became a committee member. She wanted to know what was going on. She studied fine arts online and began painting and drawing. Her abstract expressionism phase was her most prolific and she literally threw herself into it. <laughs> as, a mem as members, we participated in members' exhibitions and Helen won a prize for one of her drawings. And we were fortunate enough to have access to a studio space for a year, which was a great experience for us and we were very thankful for the opportunity to just be able to create in a studio space. She strove for excellence in her work and the presentation of her work, and that was recognised by the judges in the competition. Helen loved making things. She loved craft. She used fabric and recycled jewellery. She made chooks and cheap, and beaded bags and embroidered bags, and she embroidered Christmas or ornaments. And hard rubbish was a great time of joy. <laughs> it, was, it was an opportunity to be creative. <laughs> Amen. And she turned discarded items, as people have said before, into garden features, like an old ladder became a wall sculpture. Old chairs were repainted in bright colours as pot plant holders. And as Tim said, I think the door became a decorative feature for plants. Mm -hmm. She was always busy, always doing something. And Helen, Jans and Pickles were famous and were made with whatever was in season, and every visitor was given a pot to take home. She had a great can-do attitude. She'd had a career in nursing, as Dennis said, and later supported Dennis in his chiropractic clinic. Helen adapted as the clinic updated all of its computer systems, and she embraced that challenge. The next challenge was Thread Together. She became the agent for Three Together in South Australia. She attracted a group of women to help sort and pack clothing to be redistributed to welfare organisations. The clothing came from Sydney. Apart from clothing rescued from the retail industry, there were remnants of fabric, which the group soon sewed into bags for the clothing, which were given to people for free, and the gifted clothing was put into the beautifully made bag. And uh, the remnants were made into happy rugs and toiletry bags for homeless shelters and for the homeless and for men's shelters. The group met weekly for sewing and sorting, each person contributing according to their talents. And it was a wonderful, vibrant group who became firm friends. Helen enjoyed, invited me to join this group later, once the group was established. And that group would not have been possible if it hadn't been for the wonderful support of Dennis, who was there every week. 
supporting Helen, Helen and being hospitable to those people who came into the school. So thread together, embrace Dennis as one of its own and grew to love him too. The la last year, Thread Together partnered with the Anglicare South Australia. CMI don donated two vans to be used as mobile wardrobes. And I quote from Anglicare South Australia. We named one of our mobile wardrobes after the beloved he Helen in honour of her outstanding contribution to the community. The van is called Helen. The other one is called Pam. Uh, honouring Pam Orlick for her outstanding service to the community. The vans go north and south of the city, giving out free clothing, shoes and accessories to whoever, whoever needs them. Helen loved the Thread Together women as they loved her, and they have vowed to continue her good works under the new leadership of Rose. I just wanted to thank Helen's immediate family for the wonderful support they gave her through her illness. They were always sensitive to her needs and to her comfort. They cared for Helen with love and humour and a sense of fun which lifted her spirits. And the extended family who travelled from all over Australia to spend time with Helen, to stay, to cook, to clean, to share memories, I oh, thank you. And to Helen's close, faithful friends who visited and who brought her comfort and spiritual strength, I oh, thank you. Helen will be missed by all who loved her, her family, those who were her colleagues, those who were her friends. She had a genuine love and acceptance of people. And I can honestly say, Helen, didn't tolerate people. She loved people. Really loved them. And for that, and for that love was uh, life changing for some people. Experiencing her as well. She was a once in a lifetime friend for me. And reflecting on Helen's life, she really was an extraordinary person who led an extraordinary life. She was my spiritual compass and her light will continue to shine on for us to follow. Good afternoon. My name is Marilyn, Marilyn Nusky. And my husband, Grant, and I um, have been blessed to count Dennis and Helen Power as our dear friends for over 10 years now. So this afternoon, I'd like to share a few things about the Helen Power that I have known and loved. We've heard many times today that Helen loved people, that she accepted all those who came who crossed her path just as they were. And she did it with her um, no fuss Helen way. And because of the genuine way that she interacted with people, for many, it was not hard to take the chance to love her back. Helen embraced us all. I think many folk here, just like Tim said, whether you've known Helen for very for years and years or you've only known for her for a short time, like Tim said, it was really, really easy to think of her as our Helen. Helen often said everyone has a story and both Dennis and Helen willingly and actively listen to people's stories without prejudice or judgment. I remember Helen telling me that once she met a lady who'd never been asked to tell her story. What a gift Helen and De Dennis gave to her to know that someone cared enough to ask and then compassionately listen to her story to assign value to her life. It was a special thing. Helen saw potential in everyone. And when she had opportunity, she would quietly and gently encourage and challenge each person to explore that potential and to be brave enough to develop it and then in time see some 
um, fruit from it, even if it was just the smallest thing. Helen did this for me. As I trusted her love for me and her confidence in me, and as she gently and consistently encouraged me, I began to unlock some of the gifts and talents inside of me. Helen was my cheer squad. You know, Dennis and Helen are just like you and me, and they've had times of heartache and disappointment, and maybe even made the odd mistake or two, just like we have. And yet, Helen always celebrated the good. She'd often say, this is good. Or she'd say, that's good, Marilyn. I've lost my place. Or if something was being planned for the future and Helen was always planning something for the future, as has been said before, she always had a project on the go, she'd say, it's good, it's going to be good. If we were having a meal together, she'd say, this is good, good food, good company, and if it was winter, good fire. And if we were having bread with a meal, and Helen loved to eat bread, she would say, good bread. <laughs> Especially as, as we got older, and, and for the good of our health and our waistlines, bread became something spe very special. As I was preparing today, I could just hear, hear Helen say, it'll be good, Marilyn. And today, seeing everyone here, and all that's been prepared in her honour, I'm sure she'd say, this is good. And one more thing I believe that she'd say to us today, from her new home in heaven, she'd say, it's good here. <laughs> you know, Helen was a very observant lady and she had a very unique way of expressing her observations. And from time to time, she'd pass some of these observations on to me. So I'd like to share a couple of them with you today. For a number of years, Grant and I attended a home fellowship group that Dennis and Helen ran in their home at Westlakes and then at Rosewater. From time to time, I'd be asked to share a small message with the, with the group. But the, every week, every fortnight, the group always fell on my busiest day in my work cycle. So I was really tired by the time I got home. So then off we'd go to the meeting to participate in the meeting and I'd share my little message but by the time supper came, I was just exhausted. So I just sit quietly and not say anything. So one evening, Helen said to my husband, I've lost my place, um, Marilyn gets, Marilyn wilts when she gets tired. An interesting way of putting it. But when he told me on the way home, I just laughed because the truth was, I did. <laughs> and secondly, I just, um, was thrilled that Helen noticed that I wilted when I made, got tired and that made me feel so much so loved by her. So since that day, I do my best not to wilt in public when I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, our Helen. <laughs> Another observation is that one day quite a long, long time ago, Helen and I were having a chat. I can't remember the exact context of the conversation, but Helen just came out and said, Melancholy people take a lot of propping up. <laughs> now, I know that Helen had a lot of friends and I knew that I wasn't the only melanc melancholy person that she knew, so I wasn't upset about that at all. <laughs> because I knew that she genuinely cared for me and she wanted to see me thrive. Just like she wanted to see every person in her life thrive, even the people that move through um, casually. Actually, it was a very good observation, and I'd never thought of my melancholy temperament in those terms. Um, thanks, Al Helen. Hopefully, I need less propping up now. <laughs> Today, we've um, heard many speak about Helen's love for people, but it's important that we um, once again acknowledge her love for her family, her whole family, but particularly Dennis and their children and their grandchildren. Dennis and Helen have loved their family fiercely and through thick and thin have pursued every avenue to help their children and grandchildren thrive and flourish and to see each one reach their potential. 
but still loving them with an open hand. An excellent model for us all to follow. Thanks, Dennis and Helen. Dennis, you've loved Helen well. You said how she was loyal to you, but you have loved her well. <laughs> and I've admired how you've loved her. It's obvious that you made the discovery a long time ago about the things that um, made Helen happy. And I admire that over the years, you did what you could to help make it all possible for her. And I think it's important today to acknowledge that Helen couldn't have been the person she was and done the things she'd done. She couldn't have reached her own potential without the love and support of her husband, Dennis. And I'm sure that it's been challenging for him at times and that his boundaries have been extended in ways he didn't expect. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. We honour you today. Dennis said before that um, when Helen left school, she studied to become a nurse, a children's nurse. And with apologies to all the nurses here today, um, broadly speaking, the role of a nurse is to tend and nurture, to calm and assure, and to fix broken places. That sounds like our Helen, doesn't it? Helen was just an ordinary person, just like you and me. But her capacity to love and accept each person was a, um, who was part of her life, or people who just wandered across her life for a short time, came from her love for God. Her ability to love people was a gift from God. I believe it was actually God the Father loving each person through Helen. She was his hands and feet, his mouthpiece. Helen knew God, God used Helen's nurse's heart to tend and nurture each person, to administer his love to them as medicine, as healing balm to their broken places. I'm grateful to have had our Helen in my life. But before she was our Helen, she was God's Helen, because she had taken Jesus to be her saviour. And that is why her love and her life have touched our hearts so deeply. Thank you. So if you'd like to turn your attention to the screen, we'll see some beautiful photos celebrating Helen's life. Thank you. Oh
wonderful afternoon we've had today just having a glimpse of Helen's life there and the people that have shared their stories and it's just given us a, a great glimpse of the amazing woman that she was and those of you that can stand today would you please stand with me now as we bid farewell to Helen and as we commit her body to its natural end. So Helen, we bid you farewell. Helen, your life we honour, your departure we accept, your memory we cherish, in grief at your death, but in gratitude for your life and for choosing us to share it with you. We thank you, Helen, for the good times. We thank you for your work. We thank you for your love and your laughter. But most of all, Helen, we thank you for just being you. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to be seated for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, this now concludes Helen's funeral service. In just a short moment, we'll have the pallbearers come forward. We will then uh, both wheel and carry her to the hearse, where then after the uh, family, you're welcome to join them in placing a petal, or as was said earlier, a leaf from the uh, home where she grew up, uh, Horry Park. Um, we were then invited to uh, gather uh, initially here at Partridge House, inside the main house at the front. Um, you're quite welcome to join them for a cuppa. Uh, tea or coffee and also a cake, a bit of cake. And then afterwards the family warmly invite you to all gather at the Glenelg Surf Club from 4.30 for the official wake, where something a little bit stronger than tea and coffee will no doubt be served. <laughs> In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, I'll, uh, as I said, I'll invite the pallbearers and uh, those carrying the petal baskets to come forward. I will ask in preparation in just a moment if uh, those that are along the path there and on the bend, if you want to make your way around to the other side under the tree just to make uh, access a little bit easier. But ladies and gentlemen, I now invite the pallbearers to come forward and you're welcome to follow us as we head to the hearse where the final farewells will be had. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can be upstairs.
show the birds because it's quite a place to walk every time it feels. Ask if anybody that hasn't come forward, if you please, like to do so. Now. Thank you. 